Here's the touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. In a nutshell, what is car share? Easiest way to describe car share is like an Airbnb equivalent for cars. We enable car owners who have a car they're not using very much or two cars, the second one being not used very much, to be able to share and rent those cars out to other people who live nearby. We call them renters. Um, the renters can then access those cars through an application and open the car simply through the phone. So we enable owners to and rent them to renters. Ah, so it's connected to the car and it's showing you exactly which car it is. Yeah, so this is, I, I'm now in rental. Yeah. As I get closer to the car, the phone connects to the car through Bluetooth. So okay. there's no signal required, no phone signal. Okay. So that's all eradicated. This is now Bluetooth into the car. Okay. The functions to unlock and lock the car are now live. So if we unlock the car, you'll see it flash, hopefully. Sure. That's unlock. Wow. That's just unlock the car. So I'll get in the car now. Car's open. Off we go. Wow. All through your phone? Yeah. I know you're also very keen to stress the environmental implications of what you're trying to do here with car Yeah, share. I mean, there's a lot of environmental kind of positioning for the business such as ours. I mean, the most easiest one to sort of, to sort of explain is that, and this isn't just our own survey, this is a survey done with um, Como UK, which is like the car sharing charity body for the UK and businesses like ourselves. They've proven that for every one car shared, it can take up to 10 others off the road, which means that 10 other cars don't need to be produced or replaced if others are saying, look, I seldom use my car. Do you know what? I don't want to replace it with another vehicle. I'm going to use a car sharing scheme like CarShare to access cars when I need them. So that's a big deal, actually. Taking that number of cars off the roads creates such big positive benefits. The, I mean, the industrial processes that go into making the actual physical car. Of course. So imagine if we were producing half as many cars, how much emissions we would save right at the start of the process. The other great thing, of course, is that when cars are shared, the people that use them, that rent them, do it because they're purpose driven. They don't pop to the shops and therefore hire a car to go to Sainsbury's 10 minutes. They do proper activity, seeing things, seeing people, seeing places. So it reduces that short number of trips which is really positive. The other aspect is the more cars we can take off our streets because of that you know, lack of replacement, people sharing more and people accessing more, there is more space on our streets. You know, in some cities, congestion can be 25% or 25% of the congestion can be caused by the lack of a parking space. We're driving around for 20 minutes trying to find a place to park your car. With less cars in the future on our streets, much easier to find a space that congestion eases and the pollution eases. No spin, no bias, no censorship. I'm Dan Wharton, tonight. After the failure of so-called accredited journalists from our biggest broadcasters to ask the Prime Minister a single question about the Liverpool terrorist attack for the second day in a row, why is the mainstream media so reluctant to cover the scourge of homegrown Islamist extremist terrorism putting all of our lives at risk. I'll tackle that in my digest shortly before I get the opinion of my superstar panel. Tonight, the Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, the journalist Sam Dowler, and the social commentator Esther Kraku. Should we really boycott Tesco after they used a vaccine passport for Santa in their Christmas ad? Actor and reclaimed party leader Lawrence Fox and broadcaster John Gaunt will go head to head in the clash. 
Leaked government papers have revealed government plans to finally free us from dystopian COVID restrictions. But is Operation Ramp Down coming too late? We'll get the positive Professor Carol Sikora's expert take on that. Is Donald Trump going to make a sensational political comeback? American talk radio king and the politician who's been affectionately dubbed the Black Trump, Larry Elder, weighs in on that and tells me about his own run for governor of California at 1020. As Austria plunges its non-vaccinated citizens into a lockdown, why is a segregated society based on someone's medical status being accepted? Broadcaster Carol McGiffin joins me to discuss the latest COVID dystopia in Uncancelled. GB News star Neil Oliver makes his return to the channel after being off with COVID. He'll reveal all about what he calls his adventure with the virus for the first time. That's in The Outsider. And is it time for the Queen to permanently scale back her duties as she battles ill health? We'll debate that and more in the media buzz. Plus, get a first look at tomorrow's newspaper front page. It's hot off the press. And we'll reveal today's greatest Britain Union jackass. This is Dan Wilson tonight. Let's go. Just one thing, our thoughts are all with the Queen, who, according to Buckingham Palace, is now suffering from a strained back that forced her to miss the Remembrance Sunday service at the Cenotaph for the first time in two decades. They say she'll be back to light duties this week. But should we believe Palace aides, who recently claimed Her Majesty was working at her desk at Windsor Castle, when in fact she was in hospital? At 95, it's essential the Queen slows down. Her aides have been allowing her to work far, far too hard over the past few months. She wants to, of course, but we need to protect our great monarch, who has always been there for us. My digest coming up and then my superstar panel, Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, journalist Sam Dowler and social commentator Esther Kraku. But first, the news with Polly Middlehurst. You're watching GB News, your headlines this hour. Police have named the bombing suspect who died in Sunday's Liverpool taxi explosion as 32-year-old Ahmad al Swailmin. Counter-terrorism police Northwest said they strongly believe al Swailmin was the passenger when the taxi exploded outside Liverpool Women's Hospital. The driver, David Perry, escaped with minor injuries. He's now being praised for his actions after saying he'd locked the car doors moments before the explosion. Four people have been arrested under anti-terrorism laws. A controlled explosion was also carried out today at Sefton Park as a precaution and as also part of the ongoing investigation. Meanwhile, the terrorism threat level in the UK has been increased too severe, meaning an attack is highly likely. It's a stark reminder of the need for us all to remain utterly vigilant, what yesterday showed, above all, is that the British people will never be cowed by terrorism. We will never give in to those who seek to divide us with senseless acts of violence. And our freedoms and our way of life will always prevail. Well, let's show you the scene at uh, Sefton Park today where a cordon was placed around two addresses which police say al Swailmin was connected to. Police also saying significant items were found at one of those addresses. A second property was also searched today. Away from Liverpool, three Baltic states say Belarus must be held accountable for human trafficking. Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia have all condemned the actions of the Lukashenko regime in Belarus, which has left up to 4,000 migrants camped out and stranded on the border with Poland. European foreign ministers have now agreed a fifth round of sanctions against Belarus, which will be finalised in the next few days. In the States, former Trump adviser Steve Bannon has appeared before a judge to face criminal contempt charges. That's after he defied a congressional subpoena from the committee investigating the U.S. Capitol riots. The Justice Department says one count was for refusing to appear for a deposition, the other for refusing to provide documents. If Bannon is convicted, he faces up to two years in jail. But speaking outside the courthouse, he said he'd fight the charges. I'm telling you right now, this is going to be the misdemeanor from hell for Merrick Garland, Nancy Pelosi, and Joe Biden. You should understand, Nancy Pelosi 
took is taking on Donald Trump and Steve Bannon. She ought to ask Hillary Clinton how that turned out for them, okay? We're going on the offense. You are up to date. I'm back in an hour. Let's get over to Dan. Why is the mainstream media so reluctant to cover the scourge of terrorism putting all our lives at risk? Yesterday at 10.59 a.m., a car bomb exploded at the UK's largest maternity hospital in Liverpool. As you can see from this shocking video taken after the bomb exploded, this could have been an incredibly deadly incident. If it wasn't for the swift actions of one brave taxi driver of Great Britain, an absolute hero called Dave Perry, who was driving the cab carrying the suspected suicide bomber who perished in the incident and has tonight been named as 32-year-old Imad al Swalmin, it's possible hundreds of lives may have been lost. At 5 p.m., six hours after the terrorist attack, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson gathered at Downing Street for a post-COP26 press conference in front of Westminster's accredited journalists, as Jacinda Ardern likes to call them. Unbelievably, there was not one question about the Liverpool car bomb. Instead, this is what they asked Boris about. You demanded that all Conservative MPs vote to delay any punishment for Owen Paterson. Uh, the Chancellor said last week uh, that your government uh, needs to do better when it comes uh, to standards. Do you agree with him and do you think you made a mistake over Owen Paterson that you now regret? You told your cabinet this, this week that you saw the handling of the Owen Paterson affair as an unforced error. Why are you so unwilling to say that publicly? We had a poll yesterday showing two thirds of voters want you to apologise over sleaze. I sense you're a little bit reluctant to do that. What would you say to those people who think that you've got it wrong? It's astonishing to me that virtually every journalist asked the PM a supplementary gotcha question about Tory sleeves for the second week, rather than quizzing him about an actual car bomb at the Liverpool Women's Hospital that same day. A shocking misjudgment that I think is indicative of the media's reluctance to cover the very real jihadi threat to innocent Brits on a daily basis. We saw, after the shocking terror attack that killed the MP David Ames last month, that the media and the political establishment would rather talk about anything else than ask the hard questions about the homegrown threat of Islamic extremism. So we saw endless discussions about the online safety bill, general civility in society and the way we treat our MPs, all of which were completely irrelevant. These ISIS-inspired terrorists are the sorts of monsters who targeted Manchester children attending an Ariana Grande concert. They have no humanity, and we must not rest while they continue to operate on our shores. The media must ask the difficult questions. How are they being radicalised? Who is behind the radicalisation? Why isn't the PREVENT programme working? Does it need more funding? Instead, this is the response we saw today from Labour's Shadow Health Secretary Jonathan Ashworth, who offered his sympathies to the family of the dead suspected terrorist, rather than discussing how they were allowed to nearly blow up a hospital. Shocking that uh, that would happen anywhere, but particularly outside a women's and maternity hospital. Obviously, we pay our respects and send our condolences to the family of the man who lost his life. I'll obviously want to thank the emergency services for the way in which they responded. Unbelievable. He's since apologised, but you get my point. This afternoon, the UK's terror threat level was raised from substantial to severe, meaning another attack is now highly likely. But shamefully, the total silence from our broadcasters continued at a 3pm press conference hosted by the Prime Minister to talk about booster jabs. This is what they asked him about, including a ridiculous gotcha question about why he doesn't wear a damn mask every second of the day. And just briefly on Belarus and Poland, do you agree with the head of the armed forces that the UK must be ready for war with Russia? And uh, just on rail, um, new voters, uh, uh, sorry, new Tory voters in the north will find out this week that you've significantly pared back plans for um, uh, new rail links in the, in the north. Um, 
What's your message to them and why should they vote Tory again? Um, Prime Minister, there have been a few incidents in recent weeks uh, at COP and on your visit to Hexham General Hospital uh, where you were pictured without a mask in settings where you might have been expected to wear one. Do you accept that by doing that you are sending a message that might not be appreciated by the two gentlemen stood alongside you on the podium there? On the day of a confirmed terrorist attack on our shores, that's what the Press Association thought was the most important question to ask the Prime Minister. Shameful. Absolutely shameful. It was left to the Daily Telegraph's political editor, Ben Riley smith to ask the lone question about terrorism at the press conference. And just one more topic. You have raised the threat level to severe. Can you tell the public anything about uh, the motivation of what happened in Liverpool and what would be your message to voters who might be worried right now? But it's not one more topic. This is the only topic that matters today when it comes to talking to the Prime Minister. And yes, there is a police investigation ongoing and four people have been arrested, so we all must be careful as much remains unknown. But what is blindingly obvious is that hundreds of mothers and babies could have been killed if that car bomb had been successfully detonated. Or perhaps hundreds of folk marking Remembrance Sunday at the cathedral down the road we had a lucky escape yesterday. We won't keep having lucky escapes. It's the responsibility of the media to continually pressure our politicians to ensure they don't forget about the clear and present danger Islamist extremist terrorism poses to the UK, no matter how politically incorrect such conversations might be. We cannot look away any longer. But to respond now, my superstar panel, Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, the journalist and broadcaster Sam Dowler, and the social commentator Esther Kraku. Esther, two days in a row, days. the entire Westminster journalism establishment has been there to ask the Prime Minister about what his government is doing to tackle homegrown terrorism on the day of a terrorist attack and then the day when the police confirmed that it was in fact a terror attack. And we have one question from the Daily Telegraph? You see, is there some sort of conspiracy of silence amongst the Westminster journalists? What's going on? But the thing is, they, they, their silence on this issue has kind of lent to the fact that they really are just in, a, in it for themselves and they have an agenda that they're trying to push to the public. How can you possibly say that you're acting in the interest of the national public and yet you're, you're not asking the Prime Minister any questions regarding a terrorist attack? and something that really has an, an impact on our safety as citizens of this country. I mean, it's completely insane. But it's, it just also shows the fact how happy they are about this Tory Silly story that's come out and how much they want to push on it, despite the fact that really this could have happened to any politician, because I, I personally think most politicians are capable of this. I think that just it depends on how close you are to the sources of, power, of real power in this country. I don't think it's immune to Labour or Lib Dem or SNP or anyone. Um, but this is the agenda they want to push because they're just so happy that this finally happened. And they're really pushing the real story, what we should really be concerned about <clears throat> just, you know, on, on the back benches. I mean, unintended. Carol, look, I, un I completely understand that this was an ongoing situation. But do not tell me, do not tell me that if a car bomb had exploded outside the Houses of Parliament, mm. that every single Westminster journalist would not have been asking the Prime Minister about it. It's almost like because it was in Liverpool, mm. uh, it didn't matter somehow. I was going to say that. You know, I mean, you and I think the same about the way some TV stations report terror attacks. The fact that they will not use the word Islamist when they're mm. talking about this terror attack, when we know that's the case. This, I think, is different. This was a different profile from a normal terror attack. One, it was in a, it was in a northern city. Um, two, the w there was only one person involved. This is a guy who was not known to MI5. Um, he had come here from the Middle East a few years ago, and and and. It seems from what I've read today, this was a, this, he was, I don't think this guy is a, is a bona fide terrorist, if you like. I think he probably is a lone person who's gone nuts. But that is no excuse for not covering it. You know, we, the, the thing could have been much worse. Apparently the, the <coughs> detonator went off and the charge itself didn't <coughs> go off because that would have killed that taxi driver for a start. He was incredible. I don't and know how he had still could have killed so many it, people. It could have killed so many people. I mean, I don't think this guy even knew where he was going and I think on that basis because it wasn't confirmed I'm not sticking up for the media I think what you just said was right it was in Liverpool there wasn't a big death toll there was one person dead it was the guy who did it so no 
one cares about him. And I think they're just... But, I mean, oh, but Jonathan Ashworth. Yeah, but, well, yes. <laughs> but, a, but apart from the Tory Slee... I, the Tory Slees thing is incredible. They are desperate to get Boris to say sorry. Mm. It's their obsession. I mean, I just yeah. saw the woman from Sky there. She's obsessed with getting him to say <laughs> sorry. He's not going to say no. sorry. He's always just going to say it was handled yeah. badly. That, Boris never says sorry. Yeah. Prime ministers tend not to, you know. So it's mad to do that. But I think, I think the reason it wasn't given the coverage it should have been was because one person died. It was the terrorist, uh, and they were thinking it's not a big, it's it's but not Sam, a big deal. But of today, course, it is. today the government hosts a Cobra meeting attended mm. by the prime minister. The threat level is raised, meaning that attack is now mm. highly likely. How can you tell me? that booster jabs is a more important story <laughs> today than I, that. I think we've been living under a terrorist threat for quite a long time now. And um, obviously, I mean, I, I was reminded of, um, you know, back when Theresa May was prime minister and she would always say, we've held a Cobra meeting. She would talk about it. She would come on television to talk about it. And Boris hasn't come to talk about it. So the onus really is on him. It isn't, <clears throat> it isn't really down to the journalists who want to ask what they want to ask. It is. But also at the same time, this is, this is some sort of tin he pot. He shouldn't say it's the tin agenda. pot terrorist. You, you don't. If you if you wanted if you wanted to drive a car into the hospital, he wouldn't have asked a cabbie to do it. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Women this is, this is, is, I think that's making some a sort of, of a very serious situation. Because no, if you, you watch the video that GB News showed earlier today mm. in full. Oh my goodness, Esther! Yeah, it was Even though the I've bomb was not properly horrid. detonated, <clears throat> many, many people could have been mm. killed. Even if he had walked into the reception area or had been standing but right outside the cathedral. But you know, if it was strapped on him but, or but, it was stuffed in the car, that's Sam, what we should be asking. But Sam, the you're, you're, yeah. you're wrong. He should be coming on to tell us about it. You're wrong. Than... You're wrong about Boris because every prime minister wants to dodge questions about mm. situations that the but government. Theresa should be never doing. Well, well, no, she did. Yes, she did. She did. But the bottom line is, it is the journalist's job. It is our job as journalists to get to the truth, mm -hmm. and nobody course, was interested and of course, in getting the point to is, the truth. I understand, final word to you, Esther, I understand he's going to hide behind the idea that there's a police investigation going on, and of course that's very important. That doesn't stop journalists asking questions about the failure of the Prevent programme. Yeah. These homegrown terrorists who seem to have been radicalised over the past year during lockdown, because we need to stop the next one. But you're assuming that these journalists actually care about the, the country. They only care about their agenda. I mean, in a, in, in not a, true. In, that is not true. That is not true. That is not true. In a situation where, where where women and children could have lost their lives mm. if that man actually made it out of the, the, yes. the taxi and just made it a few feet in, within the door, you're telling me your biggest concern is Tory sleeves. That's but, the biggest concern after that event, which was well, a non-event. Not, not one. Thing. I'll just repeat. I'll asked. just repeat. Not a single question, as Esther said, was asked mm. by a national broadcaster either yesterday or today about a terrorist attack. Well, they're not today, vetted, they're not questions not vetted beforehand. Today, no. no, but today it's unforgivable. Yesterday, I mean, it wasn't confirmed until much, much later yeah. in the day that it was a terrorist yeah. attack. So yesterday there's half an excuse. Today there's, there's no absolutely excuse. no excuse. No, indeed. No. Carol Malone, Sam Dowler, Esther Crack, who my superstar panel, they are here all night. But coming up, leaked Whitehall plans have revealed a COVID exit plan that ends the government's obsessive control over our lives. But is it too little too late? Carol Sakura, the positive professor, is here at 9.30. But up next in The Clash, actor and reclaimed party leader Lawrence Fox goes head-to-head -head with broadcaster John Gaunt to debate whether we should boycott Tesco over its advert showing Santa with a vaccine passport. What do you think on this one? My email address, dan at gbnews.uk, or you can tweet us at gbnews. Back in two. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics <laughs> because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there.
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Time now for The Clash. Tesco's festive ad seems to have missed the memo when it comes to staying politically neutral. One scene has sparked outrage because it shows Santa flashing his vaccine passport so he can avoid quarantine, infuriating freedom campaigners who believe showing your health papers belongs to an authoritarian regime. Have a look for yourself. Breaking news. Santa could be quarantined. quarantined. Next. The ad has been branded coercive and received 1,500 complaints so far. Plus, a social media campaign calling for people to hashtag boycott Tesco is also gathering pace. So, is the advert just tasteful propaganda or just a bombastic nod to the times we live in? And should we really boycott Tesco because of it? You're now able to vote on that question on Twitter at GB News. And I'll bring you the results in some of your emails from dan at gbnews.uk in just a moment. But to debate at first, I'm joined by the actor and Reclaim Party leader, Lawrence Fox, and the broadcaster, John Gaunt. Good evening to you both. Lawrence Fox, you're annoyed about this ad, right? You think we should be boycotting Tesco? Um, yes, I do, Dan. I think it's appalling that children should be not only told that, you know, Santa slightly doesn't exist, because he obviously does, but also oh, that we absolutely we're, we're... does. He absolutely does. And we're in a position where, where, where Tesco's are turning around and saying that ch children's enjoyment of Christmas is dependent on a COVID passport, which is not even law in the UK at the moment. I, I, I'm absolutely astonished that our, our supermarkets are trying to be the moral arbiters of what goes on in our country. You know, it, 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 Christmas does not belong to the government. It doesn't belong to anybody else. It belongs to families and, and individuals, and that's what it is. So Tesco's can do one, and I won't be shocked there and I'm not going to be shopping at Marks and Spencer's with their silly pronouns. I'm not going to be shopping at um, John Lewis with their with their ridiculous non-binary alien non-Christmas anti-Christian message. I'm, I'm fed up with it actually and I think the people of this country are as well. We don't want our supermarkets to tell us what to think. John Gorn, isn't that a fair point? You know that vaccine passports are highly controversial, very political. Why on earth is Tesco trying to say to folk like Lawrence and myself who are so opposed to these things uh, that we're not part of their campaign. Well, both of you should stop being so precious. I mean, you're the people who've been saying we don't want things cancelled. You're always up on your soapbox, and I largely agree with you. And it's Christmas, not April Fool. I can't believe that Lawrence is getting his knickers in a twist about this. And Tesco's, of course, may I remind you, are not owned by the government. They're owned by their shareholders and indeed their customers who go there. You're both absolutely pathetic getting wound up about this. And in terms of the COVID passport, Father Christmas, it's clearly a joke, isn't it? Like we have in lots of these adverts of Christmas. If you don't like it, don't shop there. Fair enough. But the idea that you two, who are the king of anti-cancel, now want to cancel this, you make me laugh. You're both pathetic. Lawrence, how you do you respond to that? Father... You can't cancel Father Christmas. He's real. 
You can't say that Cat Father Christmas, Christmas is Christmas. clearly a You're joke. You're looking the subject up. We all know Father Christmas is real, and we know kids might be watching. But why are you two getting so worked up about this? I well, John, the, f- John, the, the first thing I'd say, the I first thing I'd say, Lawrence, on a serious note, there's a big difference, isn't there, between making a personal choice as a consumer not to shop at a supermarket and cancelling something. Those two things are very different, aren't they? You want it cancelled. So does boycott Tesla. No, uh, they I'm, want I, I, that, was, that, that was Lawrence. Don't Let change Lawrence the subject, respond. Dan. Let they Lawrence want respond. it cancelled. Let Lawrence respond. I will. I would. Thank you, John. I would prefer it that supermarkets didn't tell me what I should think and how I should think. And I would prefer it that their nudge units, that the government push through these supermarkets to tell us what we should and shouldn't accept. We, we were just left to choose where we like to get our pork sausage from. And I don't want to get my pork sausage from a supermarket that says that Santa, bless him, he's got such a big year, you know, this year, because the, the government have immiserated everybody. And Santa's got such hard work to do. And to make him have to produce his COVID passport, well, which isn't even law, is, is equating for children the idea that Santa, in order to enjoy Christmas, they're going to need to have, that Santa's going to need to have a COVID passport. It's vile, disgusting propaganda led by a fear-driven, revolting government that I have no faith in. And I think it's disgusting. And that's just my view. I'm not saying you have to agree with me. It's just my view. I think... I, not, I think you should not have for expressing it. children, Lawrence. I don't think children will see it in I've the got two moment. children, thanks very much, and I love them with all my heart. You are trying to cancel Tesco, and you're the man who gets up on your soapbox all the time, largely on the things that you get upset about. I kind of agree with you. But on this, I laughed my duck off when I heard that this was the debate tonight. I agree with you as well, Mr. Wooten, that the most important thing we should be talking about is our government's absolute failure to deal with Islamist terror. I'm quite willing to stop the debate now and let's get on to that subject because that's what we should be talking about. But I think there's a great irony that Lawrence has taken this step. Well, do you know what? I'm this, actually this going to take point. you up on that offer. I think I'm he's going to wrong. take and he's I'm going to take you up on that. I'm going to take you up on that offer. Yeah, please because do. Because we, we, we <laughs> spoke about this at the top of the show, and I have been absolutely horrified today, and I know both of you expressed a view on this. Yeah. Lawrence, what on earth is going on? There was a terror attack on our own soil yesterday. The police confirm it to date. They increase the terror threat level. Not one question from a broadcaster to the Prime Minister about what the hell we're doing to stop these Islamist extremists. Lawrence, what is going on? Well, the bought and paid for media are paid for by the government. They're the media, they're the government propaganda arm. I don't agree with anything they say. One just has to sit and think that in 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 a place of worship, where people are remembering those who sacrificed their lives knowingly or unknowingly for our right and freedom to, to, to go and make an attack on that. And because some stupid, half-ignorant moron suicide bomber can't get his watch right, he decides he's going to go up and blow up a bunch of women and children. I think this is something that we should stand up and we should go, these do not align with the values of our country. And we should be able, without being called Islamophobes, to be able to sit there and say this is revolting and disgusting and we should and we you're not watching women and children getting off these boats in on the south coast you're not you're watching a lot of military age men getting off the boats in the south coast and we should be uh, we should reclaim our borders and we should stop this dreadful government and its inability to deal with uh, illegal immigration look at what's happening in america look at what's happening here J- john What do you think has been going on today? It's successive governments in this country have not taken the Islamist threat. It is not Islamophobic to say we should condemn terror and we should be very, very tough on it. I agree with you, Lawrence. They reckon there are about 40,000 people on the watch list. How the hell can they keep a watch on them? Meanwhile, Dover, it's quicker to get to Britain, it feels, in a dinghy at Dover than go through the right channels. In fact, if you go on holiday at Christmas or when you come back from doing your film, Lawrence, it'll probably take you longer to get into Britain than somebody arriving at Dover. This has got to stop. And, you know, we've had Boris going on with his green agenda. He's still going on about it. And the journalists, the MSM, are in bed with him. Uh, 
it's probably quite a crowded bed, but they're in bed with him, aren't they? And they're not asking those questions. Dan, you are absolutely right on that. They should have been pinning him to the wall, pinning him to the wall. Yep. How are you going to deal with this? And the fact that it was in Liverpool, again, the London-centric, the metrocentric... I know, because I'm sorry. Uh, if, if that car didn't seem bomb to be bothered had... that it was Scousers who were going to die. If that car bomb had gone off outside Westminster, you know it would have dominated that entire press conference. Absolutely. And, Lawrence, the point is hundreds of women and children could have died or hundreds of people walking out of that cathedral. I just will never accept that that should not have been the number one issue uh, that the media was talking it's about so over the past 24 hours. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It's unbelievable and it's horrendous. And what's even more unbelievable is that we're living in a country where it's easier to get it here from France than it is for someone from Wales to go to a pub. And that's what we're dealing with in this country. We are very, very dangerous territory now in terms of what's going on. And we need to sit there and we need to go, OK, what are the issues here? What are the problems? You know, we're removing the, the individual liberty from law abiding, normal citizens. And we are allowing for the sake of not offending certain groups of people an enormous amount of inequality and these people your your diversity and equity uh, inclusiveness crowd on the far left will condone illegal immigration but they will not protect the rights of someone to go to the pub in wales and this is absolutely horrendous and um well our country is heading down a very very dark path john if that I, islamist I just... terrorist had actually got anywhere near the hospital got out yeah. of the car he would have murdered slaughtered not just white Christians, but all kinds of people. I saw a news report today and they actually interviewed a lady that looked like she was a Muslim. She had the headscarf, et cetera, et cetera. These people are terrorists. These people are Islamists. These people are, you know, and so you can condemn them and you should be free to be able to condemn them because he would have slaughtered people just indiscriminately. That's what it's about. And, and, and There's 40,000 out there. Let's stop pussyfooting around yep. and let's get on top of the Islamist threat. Well, yes, and, and John, remember, this is the second time in a matter of weeks where the establishment, both the media establishment and the political establishment, have not wanted to talk about this threat because after the killing yeah. of David Ames, they wanted to talk about anything other than Islamist extremism. And... I cannot believe it's happening again. It's history repeating, and it has to change. Just, just like they don't want to talk about what's happening at Dover, if it wasn't for Nigel Farage, God bless him, and indeed GB News, which is why GB News is so important to the political landscape of our great country. I might disagree with Lawrence on other things, but when it comes to that, it was only because of Farage who's been highlighting the problem at Dover for months and months and months. And then GB News, when it was born, has obviously taken that on board. And Mark White's reports have been really illuminating. But only now do they do a little bit about it on the bloated broadcasting corporation. Know. Because Slide they know they have to. They know they have to. Well, look, I'm, I'm very glad fun. we ended on a note of agreement. That's the broadcaster, John Court, and the leader of the Reclaim Party and actor, Lawrence Fox. Uh, let's just rewind, though. I'm going to go back to the whole yep. Santa thing, because in a statement, oh. a Tesco spokesperson said, we set out to create a campaign which took a light-hearted view on how the nation is feeling, and it has been well-received by colleagues and customers. We are still in the midst of a pandemic, and the advert reflects the current rules and regulations regarding international travel. So... Who do you agree with? Lorna on email says, how dare you use Santa Claus to push the vaccine? Yes, I am double vaccinated, but many are not. And my door will certainly be open wide for Santa without proof of vaccination. Barbell on Twitter says, we can disagree with an advert without threatening to boycott. That is exactly what cancel culture is. It cuts both ways. And 59% of you agree that we should boycott Tesco over its use of Santa as a vaccine passport ambassador, while well, 41% of you disagree. Coming up, he's the man who's been dubbed the Black Trump, and he recently gave the Democrats a run for their money in California. But will he predict a sensational return for the Donald? Legendary Republican radio host and politician Larry Elder joins me from LA. But in The Positive Professor after the break, have the government's plans for ending COVID restrictions come long after the damage has already been done? Carol Sikora investigates in just a moment.
watching GB News Live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Neil Oliver, Carol McGiffin and Larry Elder all on the way. But it's time for The Positive Professor now with Carol Sikora. Is the government's obsession with COVID regulations ruling so many parts of our lives? Is it finally going to come to an end? According to the government's leaked official COVID exit plan, codenamed Operation Rampdown, restrictions will be dramatically scaled back next year. So Brits will have to learn to live with the endemic illness and its seasonal surges. The secret 160-page Whitehall dossier revealed by GB News presenter Isabel Oakeshott in the Mail on Sunday details plans to shut down test and trace, acts legally enforce self-isolation and focus on the fight for local outbreaks. But it does ominously warn about the potential of new mutant strains. The government's four key planning scenarios are also described in the documents, including the best case quick farewell scenario, which has daily cases peaking at 30,000, and the long goodbye, which forecasts a worst case scenario summer peak of 85,000 cases a day. So this news will be a huge relief to most sensible Brits. But has it come too late to discuss this? I'm joined by Carol Sikora now. Carol, shouldn't we be doing all of this already? We should be. I mean, the words are just crazy. Ramp down, that's Operation Ramp Down, that's what this is about. It's a PR exercise. And as you, you mentioned, two of the things, a quick farewell, that, that's the optimal scenario where it just goes, no new mutants, everyone's fine, vaccinations in place and so on. Then leaving soon is the second scenario. And the third one is the long goodbye. I mean, it's just unbelievable. These documents don't get leaked because someone's got cross and just sent it to the Daily Mail. This has been leaked deliberately by the government just to test out what people are thinking. Uh, and that's been the pattern throughout the COVID pandemic, to release a little bit of information, see how it goes down. The whole vaccine passport business, the Santa Claus, which you just talked about. Mm. Fantastic story. Uh, and it's just testing out the public reaction. And this is very clever brainwashing, behavioural psychology, it's called in real terms, but it is brainwashing. We've got a, a scared nation at the moment. You can see them on the streets, especially the older people. They're scared. And we've got to get them out of that somehow. And we've got to get them out in one piece. And the government doesn't know what to do, it's clear. And they're being advised different things by different experts. Yeah, I agree. And I think Operation Ramp Down should be beginning before the winter, whereas they seem to want to continue through the winter in this paranoid state where the state will fund your free COVID test at any point. 
and where you legally have to stay at home. And to me, Carol, that means that businesses are not going to be able to get back to normal and it's going to continue to cost society dearly. I mean, if Santa Claus can't get back to normal, how can businesses get back to normal? I mean, I'm being facetious, but it's true. I think the key factor, which we talked about last week, is the NHS. And we heard the chief executive of the NHS England, Amanda Pritchard, tell us little porky pies about how many people are in hospital. 14 times the number of last year was the quote she gave. Uh, 14 times the number that were at the same time last year would be more than beds we've actually got in the NHS. So that can't be true. And she should have spotted that. So at the moment, there are 8,000 people in hospital. There are 141,000 beds in the NHS, depending, plus or minus 10%. No one really knows how many acute beds there are in the NHS. Uh, but if we, if we assume it's that, it's a relatively small percentage. It's under 10%. As long as it stays under 10%, the NHS will cope. What it can't cope with is all sorts of problems on the side, like insisting on vaccination for lower level staff that may not have that much contact with patients, and yet are forced to have the vaccination against their will, and they'll leave, they'll find other jobs, they're not paid much in the NHS, and they'll go somewhere else. So on the whole, we've got to do something better. Operation Ramp Down, I think, is about six months too late. We should have been doing this in the summer of this year, so we can get into 2022, you know, Happy New Year 2022 is putting COVID right behind us. I agree. But instead, Carol, we have further threats today from folk like Jonathan Van Tam and the press conference who suggests that if we don't all have our boosters, Christmas might be at threat. It's almost as if they've become addicted to the language of scaring the population rather than actually educating us and allowing us to make our own decisions in a free society. That's the key, is we all make our own decisions. Vaccination, no vaccination, travel, no travel, whatever you want to do. Wear a mask if you want to, but don't object to people not wearing a mask. I mean, it's uh, it, and social distancing and so on. You know, it's unbelievable to think what we've been through. For what? For most people that have COVID, and I've had it, I've tested positive. I've had no symptoms at all with it. And that's the pattern for most people. So I'm not saying it's not a serious illness. I fully understand that. But, you know, we're killing more people for other reasons because we're treating COVID in this roundabout way. Let's get rid of testing people that haven't got any symptoms. Test and trace has to go. And it's it's been a calamity, test and trace, all the way along. It's not effective. And we know that. It's not really a contact tracing mechanism. You know, for tuberculosis, when I was a student, which was rife in the UK and still has pockets of TB, we had very good contact tracing. The same for sexually transmitted infections. But for this, it's just been a joke. Managed by highly paid management consultants from the, one of the big four. And it's really been a disaster. It's not NHS test and trace. It's a cobbled together package of different people employed by the hour. Some of them at great expense. Some of the management consultants are on thousand pound a day packages. Um, it is just crazy how we've spent 37 million on test and trace. That's got to come to an end. And I'm glad to see Ramp Down takes them out of the book. Carol Sakura, speaking sense as ever. That is our positive professor who says Operation Ramp Down should have been going on six months ago, and I couldn't agree more. Carol will speak again next week. Coming up after the Republicans stormed victory in Virginia, we talked to the man who might be in with a shot in California. The US political and media legend Larry Elder joins me after 10. But next, Neil Oliver's been a voice of reason for the public throughout the pandemic, and now he's been through his own COVID adventure. He'll talk all about his experience for the first time straight after the break. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. Things turning quite windy overnight across northern Britain, and that'll stay that way through Tuesday as well. There'll be a bit of rain for Scotland and Northern Ireland. But most of England and Wales will be dry thanks to this area of high pressure. It's further north, though, where this low and this set of weather fronts is approaching. Ahead of all of that, we've got a, a dying weather front that's still been making for uh, quite a dank and drizzly day over parts of northern England and Wales. And still some rain and drizzle here through the evening, but it continues to fizzle out. 
Uh, for the south, we could see some fog patches where we have some clearer skies, and that could take a while to clear on Tuesday. Meanwhile, that weather system really pepping the winds up across the far northwest. Quite mild here, but elsewhere, uh, a bit of a chilly start to Tuesday. Mostly grey starts, some places seeing a bit of sunshine. A bit of fog in the south will take a, a while to clear away. Could stick around certainly through the morning rush out. It's going to turn wet across western Scotland and for a time through Northern Ireland. Spell of rain here through the middle of the day. That'll be followed by some lively showers too across the far northwest. But for most of England and Wales, it'll stay dry. Yes, lots of cloud, but where we see some brightness, it's going to be pretty mild. 12, 13 degrees. Through Tuesday evening, that rain will trickle into parts of northern England and Wales for a time, but again, it kind of fizzles out. Lots of showers will come into Northern Ireland and western Scotland, some snow on the tops of the mountains across Scotland. Staying windy here as well. That will, uh, again, be a feature of the weather on Wednesday. Quite a blustery day with showers for northern and western Scotland. The odd one for Northern Ireland, northwest England, but again, many southern and eastern areas dry on Wednesday, probably a bit brighter as well, particularly in the south. Better chance of seeing some sunshine but a little bit cooler with temperatures back closer to average, but still double digits for most. There will be a fairly brisk breeze blowing, though, on Wednesday. It turns milder again through the rest of the week with a lot of cloud, some rain at times in the northwest, but a lot of dry weather as well. Goodbye. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Neil Oliver is the outsider tonight. And Neil, it is so brilliant to have you back because we've missed you on GB News these past couple of weeks because, Neil, I've heard you've had your own COVID adventure. How was it? Oh, oh Dan, it's good to see your happy, smiling face. You're a, you're a tonic all by yourself. Um, well, I, uh, we've been doing, as you know, for, for, uh, for getting into the studio in, in GB News. We do weekly... PCR tests and I've always had negative results and then a week ago on Wednesday that would be a, uh, must have been the fourth I did my test sent it off and on the Thursday evening I got a positive result back from the lab uh, and no notified everyone and was told to just self-isolate GB News included uh, I would say Saturday Sunday Monday it felt a bit rough um, and then, you know, thereafter, you just started to improve. Just spent the time sitting about, watching watching television, um, drinking lots of fizzy drinks, taking a healthy dose of paracetamol. I had I had a really, well, I had a, a bout of proper flu in 2018, 
you, you know the sort that just puts your head mm. down on the pillow and you can't move even if you were offered you know a 50 pound note on the floor beside you you would just say no i'll, I'll pass well covid for me was nothing like that it was uh, really? i felt i felt lousy i felt lousy but a couple of days of, of rest and uh, you know and uh, the rest of the time i've just been putting in my 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 mandatory self isolation, uh, which officially passed by Sunday, I was I was a free citizen again, and uh, and I'm I'm just uh, you're back to normal now. And you're going to be swimming in natural antibodies, Neil. Well, this is my. I'd always uh, assumed that, that one day or another uh, I would come across COVID, and you know, and I would have my own personal yeah. experience of it. We're all unique organisms, and you can't really predict at all how how each one of us is, is going to be affected until you know the until the penny drops. Um, so yes, I, I hope now that's me being through COVID, and if if everything they say is right, I I should now be coursing with. Uh, with natural immunity or antibodies uh, or, or whatever, uh, and, and hopefully, like the, hopefully the rest of the nation, as soon as possible, I just consider that I've now put COVID behind me. Yeah, totally. And the thing is, Neil, we're all going to get this thing. You know, I got it in March 2020. You got it in November 2021. We're all going to get this thing. That's the reality. So. Virus is yeah. virus. There's nothing that we can do about it. Uh, and it's glad. Uh, I, 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 I'm glad that your experience of it uh, was not even worse than the flu. But look, I, I, I've got to ask you about this bloke, uh, Neil, the, the First Minister of, of Wales, right? Because <clears throat> Mark Drakeford just gets worse by the day. And he's caused a lot of controversy rightly this weekend after he was spotted dancing maskless at a packed Diwali event, despite the fact he's been telling everyone for months and months and months that we must wear masks indoors and enforcing vaccine passports on his citizens. But look, this is Mark Drake for when he thinks we're not watching. <laughs> So there's Drakeford, no mask. That, that's what he's like when he thinks we're not watching. This is what he has to say when we are watching. Over the next three weeks, we will also extend the COVID pass. We've made COVID passes compulsory in nightclubs and in larger indoor and outdoor events just a fortnight ago. And the implementation so far has gone very successfully. While cases are so high, we will extend their use to theatres, cinemas and concert halls in two weeks' time. Neil, we're wise to these leaders now, aren't we? We know what they're like. We shouldn't trust a word that Drakeford says. I find it impossible to Im interpret these images, really. That, the, 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 the footage of him there at that celebration there, um, he must know, he, he could see that someone came in and, and deliberately filmed him. You know, the camera is held aloft and he, and he must have known in this day and age that those images would find their way out immediately into the, onto social media and the rest. So it, it is, he can't surely be, be stupid enough to think that, that the general public wouldn't get to see him blatantly breaking his own stipulations and his own regulations. Um, or, 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 as I say, it's hard to interpret, is the message simply going out that I will do what I want to do and you will simply do what I tell you to do? You know, one law for me, one law for the rest of you. So, as I say, it's, it's very difficult to understand how we should, how we should read these things. But my own, my own interpretation is that whatever vaccine passports are about, they're not about public health. They're not about any attempt to control the virus for all the reasons that are so well rehearsed now about the fact that that we know and we're being told by everyone from the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom down that, that the, the vaccines, whatever else they do, they don't stop transmission and, and you know they don't stop you catching it and they don't stop you passing it on, which means that vaccine passports in, in a health context are less than useless. They're just some, there's something else. And so you're left to uh, assume that they're about some other form of control 
uh, that there are, you know, that the, the vaccine passports under the guise of public health are just a gateway drug, uh, you know, to, to give uh, those in authority the opportunity to place us all on some kind of, uh, you know, digital identification scheme that could then easily grow arms and legs, you know, up to and including uh, a, a surveillance system of, of the kind we've, you know, we've spent a decade uh, fearing in China. Uh, you know, how, how else are we supposed to read uh, yeah. the, the fact well, that vaccine well, passports well, are energetically applied and yet they obviously aren't for a health context because there's Mark Drake for the man in Wales making the rules happily maskless in, in yeah. a crowded space? Well, of course, because my interpretation, Neil, is that this is a man who has spent the past 18 months desperately and at times, let's be honest, successfully attempting to terrify the Welsh people. Neil, he's not scared. This is not a man who's scared. And, and, and he's not a particularly healthy bloke. You know, he was not scared in a large crowd of people. So if he's not scared, why is he trying to infuse fear into his population? Well... Frightened populations are, are easier to control and easier to manipulate. If people are frightened and, and then those uh, in, in positions of authority and, and in supposedly in positions of respect, what they say pe people will instinctively follow uh, in hopes of, of freeing themselves from the fear and, and being led to safety. You know, so, so they're exploiting, those in power are exploiting a situation. I have to say that as part of my COVID experience, I was, I was contacted by, by Track and Trace um, and I had a, an, an interview that lasted about an hour and a half where, where there was a painstaking attempt made to reconstruct my, my timeline. Mm. I felt like I was like some sort of international criminal <laughs> and they, they were trying to forensically piece together Ridiculous. every single person that I had been within, you know, six inches oh. or six feet of in the last... It was, it was painstaking. And it, it, as I say, it took forever. But afterwards, that was the initial contact. And then my phone pinged incessantly with one message after another, offering me all kinds of help, support, uh, information, access to services, did I need this, did I need that, did I need food delivered, did I need you? all the rest of it. And you and you become aware of the fact that a whole industry has yeah. grown around. Oh, COVID. absolutely. And and, and people, they don't and want this industry there. to come to an end. No, well, you know, Neil Oliver. People, and, and, yeah, people out there making, making fortunes or at the very least making yeah. very good livings from it. And you have to ask yourself, why would anybody you know, throttle the, the goose that lays the golden egg. Totally. Well, Neil Oliver, I'm very glad that your isolation period has come to an end because we've missed your sage wisdom. I've missed you and too. of course, you will be back on the sofa, seven o'clock, Saturday night here on GB News. Neil, we'll speak again next week. Thank you. It's just after 10. Still to come with the Republicans winning the governor's election in Virginia, are Donald Trump's hopes of a comeback on the rise? U.S. conservative legend Larry Elder joins me in just a few minutes. Also, as Austria segregates its unvaccinated citizens with a dystopian lockdown, why is the mainstream media ignoring the huge public anger across the globe at the never-ending COVID restrictions? Broadcaster Carol McGiffin joins me in Uncancelled at 10.40. But first, should Boris really use the threat of restrictions to encourage booster jabs? Do under 50s even need one? I'll discuss that with my superstar panel and get a first look at tomorrow's newspaper front pages in the media buzz. That's straight after the news of Polly Middlehurst. Dan, thank you. Your evening headlines this hour on GB News. Police have named the bombing suspect who died in Sunday's Liverpool taxi explosion as 32-year-old Imad al Sualmin. Counter-terrorism police Northwest strongly believe al Sualmin was the passenger when the taxi exploded outside Liverpool's women's hospital. The driver, David Perry, escaped with minor injuries and he's being praised for his actions after he told people he'd locked the car doors moments before the explosion. Four people have been arrested under anti-terrorism laws and a controlled explosion was this afternoon carried out in Sefton Park as a precaution and as part of the ongoing investigation. Meanwhile, the terrorism threat level in the UK has been increased to severe, meaning an attack 
is highly likely. It is a stark reminder of the need for us all to remain utterly vigilant. What yesterday showed above all is that the British people will never be cowed by terrorism. We will never give in to those who seek to divide us with senseless acts of violence. And our freedoms and our way of life will always prevail. Meanwhile, here's what it looked like in the Sefton Park area of Liverpool earlier on today. A cordon placed around two addresses, which police say Al Sualmin was connected to. Police say significant items were found at one of the addresses. A second property is also being searched. Away from Liverpool, Britain has accused the president of Belarus of engineering a migrant crisis in an effort to undermine European unity. Thousands of migrants are still trapped on the Belarus border with Poland, where the authorities are refusing to allow them to enter the EU. Boris Johnson has said the UK stands shoulder to shoulder with its European allies as a fifth round of sanctions against Belarus will be finalised over the next few days. In the States, the former Trump adviser Steve Bannon has appeared before a judge to face criminal contempt charges. That's after he defied a congressional subpoena from the committee investigating the Capitol riots. The Justice Department said one count was for refusing to appear for a deposition, the other for refusing to provide documents. If Bannon is convicted, he faces up to two years in jail. Speaking outside the courthouse, Mr Bannon said he would fight the charges. And England has secured a place at next year's World Cup in Qatar with a 10-0 win away over San Marino in their final qualifying match. Captain Harry Kane netted four goals. Emile Smith-Rowe also scored on his debut. And Gareth Southgate's team-led group uh, won and San Marino have not won a single game. Meanwhile, Scotland have secured a seeded playoff spot with 2-0 win over Denmark. And Northern Ireland have drawn 0-0 with Italy in their World Cup qualifier. You're right up to date. Now back to Dan Wooden and tonight. Tomorrow's news tonight now in our media buzz. And let's kick off with the very first look at the front pages hot off the press. The Metro reports the wife of the Hero cab driver says her husband is lucky to be alive after a suspected suicide bomber blew up his taxi. The driver of the cab, who has been named as David Perry, was treated in hospital after fleeing the car just before it burst into flames and has been discharged. The Independent leads with the news of the UK's threat level being raised to severe following the Liverpool terrorist attack. Police investigating the terror plot carried out a controlled explosion at a house in nearby Sefton Park after detectives discovered bomb-making equipment, according to the paper. Also on the front page, Steve Bannon has surrendered to the FBI after the ex-Trump advisor refused to testify before Congress. Let me bring my superstar panel back with me now as the Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, the journalist and broadcaster Sam Dowler and the social commentator <coughs> Esther Krakou. Now, the big story the government wanted you to be talking about today, the coronavirus booster program, which has been extended to the over 40s after government scientists said protection from the first two jabs is waning. Now the Prime Minister reckons the concept of what constitutes full vaccination will need to be adjusted. There we go. Knew that was coming, didn't we? To take booster jabs into account, even adding them to COVID travel passports. When will this all end? Now the PM's threatening more restrictions if people don't get a booster. We want to control the epidemic here in the UK. And if we want to avoid new restrictions on our daily lives, we must all get vaccinated as soon as we are eligible. So... Should we be threatened with further restrictions if people refuse to get the COVID vaccine, Esther Kraku? Absolutely not. I mean, I was, I was just asked, can I say the certain word? I think the government is taking the... Um... The proverbial. The proverbial, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I really want to say it. I know, I really want to say it. Anyway, I just... She's a lady, Sam. I know, I'm a lady. I'm She's a lady. I would, very, for so long. Well I would done, very much Krakow. like them to fruit off. 
um, and leave us alone because it's, it's just one thing after another. First, it was two weeks to slow down the curve. Then wear a mask. Then wear a mask to sleep. Then wear a mask when you're, you know, when you're awake. Then take the job. Then give the job to your kids. Then take a second job and a third job. And now, it's, when will it end? When will they just leave when us it alone? It'll end us though when it's when this virus mm -hmm. stops raging and currently, it will never go away. It will never go away. Currently, it is raging in Europe big time. And you know, for what Boris is threatening here, Austria has already told every unvaccinated person Stay they can't home. go anywhere which is, got, which is a disgrace well how dare they are they? dealing with it but what the way we're dealing with it but I you think don't think that's a disgrace sense. well i do think it's a, well i don't think it's a disgrace i, don't think, it's a disgrace I, I think it's it's one country deciding how it's going to handle covid however in this country what? we have a covid vaccination we're a third one which boosts immunity and i don't where does this I end don't, it's a no what do you mean where do does you it Vaccine well, in your COVID, cereal? As you've just said, COVID's not going anywhere. So we just so live we with have it. To yes. have and we, so we take vaccination. Oh my God. Oh my God. Of course. Well, what's next? Example, You're going to sprinkle COVID no, in your, your, no. your milk. For example, Dan was talking before about um, terrorists being radicalized over the pandemic. That's exactly what anti vaxxers have been done. Exactly. They have oh been radicalized over the pandemic yeah. by watching. We just want to be left alone. Oh, oh, leave us alone. Yes, of course you do. Of course you do. Well, I'm. Um, um, but Sam, do you want mandatory flu want... jabs? Yes. Do you want man yes. flu yes. jabs? Mandatory flu jabs, are man mandatory uh, third vaccines. And if you, yes. if, you don't, if you want to go to a concert, if you want to go to a pub, yes. restaurant, get your vaccines or just stay at home. OK, so you do right. not believe, Sam, just to clarify, you, not, you do not believe in a free society where we have control over our own we bodies. Don't, you believe, he Sam, he, he is. Not, he's he's not allowed the government. You're not, you're not, if, you're, if you're a baby, you're not, allowed to, you're not allowed to go out and about with your, without a German measles jab or polio, Well, you can't example. do it without the parents' consent, well, that's for sure. Well, of course, what that, that, what that, it's ridiculous. If smallpox came back or typhoid yes. came back, would you have an objection to getting a jab for that? If you don't or want to, yes. 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 Or the bubonic plague, or let's, let's all just descend back into the Black Death, for example. But I'm not going to have my jab for the Black Plague. Oh, no, because I've got my right. Thanks, He's for God's sake. It's like we've lost the plot. No. You know, well, you just, have lost the plot. You've completely and utterly lost. lost the plot. No. no. This, this is a virus this that has a 0.096 0. 0. infection it's still it's still still kids. There are still killed 250,000 people yes, in this country. Say, if you are vulnerable, you are allowed to have a jab. If yes. you want to have a jab, yes. you're allowed to have a jab. What you are proposing is a segregated society. It's not my proposal. Where the unjab are unable to can live. I, can I just point out that in Germany, which is the most under-vaccinated country in Europe, it is now in its fourth wave. But mm. and we're not, today, Carol, today, We are 80% double finish, jabbed. Let me finish my point. We are, but they're not. So you're saying we shouldn't have vaccines, we shouldn't all take the vaccine. In Germany, Germany, which is the most under-vaccinated country in Europe, they're now in the fourth wave, mm -hmm. and today they recorded yep. the biggest lot of infections since the start of the pandemic. So vaccines work. The evidence is... Yeah, but, Carol, what I'm telling you, I'm not arguing with that point. I'm saying to you, as I've been saying to you for weeks, coercion doesn't work. Well, and are you not proud, as of someone who is very pro this vaccine, are you not proud that the UK has been able to reach 80% double jab status? Yes. I thought it was 66% yes. double jab. Yes, but you, no. know what, you know what hacks me up when people say, people who are not going to have the vaccination, they say they're worried about putting the chemicals in their body, it's their human rights. <laughs> so was I. I was worried about putting the chemicals in my body. Good for you, but you I made that anyway choice. Because I feel it's a social... Yes. But that's but your but choice. Carol, no doctor to ever tells you that you have to have an operation when there's a risk, even if the risk is one in 100,000 chance that you might die. It is part of our free it's society. It's, it's not different. Yeah. It's not it's different. It's, 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 it's because identical. Because, no, because of our operation. This is a global yeah, exactly. pandemic. What you're talking about is one person mm. having an operation. And, and their cancer would spread to other people. Yes. You're talking Esther, about, like, you're talking about if somebody is Esther, having an operation. Me, and it would spread to other people. Esther, it's please. It's about Sam other people. Lit is to speak. I, I'm to speak. losing brain cells. And the fact that we cannot you would comprehend... Lose brain cells no, honestly, how hard, how hard, hard is it to understand that people can make individual choices about mm. their health? 
and we shouldn't force no, people that's to fine. put foreign substances but you into their body. you can't infect other people. They should be that's vaccinated. If those other people are so concerned... So you, so okay, you what can is go the point, around what is the being point of unvaccinated and it doesn't matter as long Hold as on. everybody else is vaccinated. What is the point that's of so being selfish. vaccinated? What is the point of being vaccinated if you're going to tell other people what to do? Isn't the point of being vaccinated to protect no. yourself? So why no, can't you just stay out of everyone else's No, it's to protect other people. That is the whole point. So it's not about protecting you. No, it's about protecting everybody else. So you didn't do it for you. You didn't spread it to your family, to the older people. Young people, of course, have a much lower death rate, a much lower life. It's much easier for a young person to get it. That's why they get the vaccine, in order to not pass it on to older people okay. and their older Older people who should already be vaccinated. Point. I'm glad to know, Sam, that you believe that the government should be able to enforce any form of medical treatment on you. No, all I'm saying, all I'm said. saying is oh, that you are opening up the door to the type oh, to of what, society that what? we to do what? not no, want to have. Opening the door to what exactly? To a society Give where the example. government mandates medical procedures what? on what? Like, like, citizens. Such as, yeah. such as. Can we add in a global pandemic? And also, and also give, me an, exa oh, give me an example. 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 Give me We're coming out of a global no, pandemic, not. Carol. Really this not. is becoming Tell endemic. Dan, this Dan, is Dan, becoming Dan, endemic. Dan, Deal give me an with example. It. Give me an example of these medical procedures that the government are going to force onto us. An example. I have no Anything. idea, Sam. Because believe because me, just a few exactly. months ago, it's no, just a few months it's ago, just a few months ago, this government, just like governments all around the world, including Jacinda Ardern, the COVID dictator in chief, <laughs> was saying that they were never going to mandate vaccines. Now they're saying that they are. Because it's so not you going open away. the door up to this thing, mm. and who knows where authoritarian governments take do you it. not do you not accept that vaccines are the greatest public health invention of the last century do you mm. not agree 100 no, plumbing is yes. <laughs> plumbing <laughs> is. that's why it is up to an individual no. choice no it is no. not when, it not is. when that if it's that great allow the public to make the decision and the, the vast majority of the public have made that decision and just to wrap this up yes wrap it up the COVID, <laughs> COVID up. has a 99.1 percent yes. um, recovery rate just zero saying, point I'm zero just saying, nine I'm just saying, tell that to the families who've rate. lost people. And also... Oh, what about the ones who've lost them to obesity, heart attacks, no, diabetes, five, getting hit by a bus? There's, there's, there's only isn't that amount of lost them to there's getting no the vaccine. Cancer. And also, they, they, also, they also have... There's a, no vaccine for cancer, cancer yeah. or obesity. No, but, but, no, but there, is a, there, there is a way to prevent obesity. There is a way to prevent obesity. Look, I've got to go to something positive because that's wound us all up. So depending on whether you're a fan, the idea of Adele overseeing your engagement in front of thousands of people would either be a dream come true or a complete nightmare but it's exactly what happened to one American couple during the singer's one night only concert in Los Angeles for Oprah Winfrey have a look at what went down if you make a noise I'm gonna kill you right, turn the lights down, turn the lights down. what are we doing Quentin Quentin take it off take it off oh my god Babe, look at me, 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 look at me. Look at me. Oh my god. Look at me. Will you oh, marry me, hello Ashley? Oh, in real life. In real life. <laughs> yeah. Yes? <laughs> hello Ashley. Yay. Thank God you said yes, because I didn't know who I was going to have to sing this song to next. You or him, oh my god. She's so in shock. <laughs> oh, that was lovely. A little cry. I can't go. Oh. Right, here we go. This is for you two. Oh, what a lovely moment. Esty, that's your worst nightmare. It is though. my absolute worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't propose to me like that. It's just no, no. Sam, you would love someone to propose to you. I like that, would right? love it like that, like big and showy. I did like the fact that she was like, "Who are these people?" <laughs> Carol Adele, she wants to sell this album, doesn't she? My God, <laughs> she, she does. She's done a lot of work, but I just love the way she left there, like an old fishwife. She looks like a million dollars. <laughs> yeah, and she's, she's and she was a trap. <laughs> Carol Malone, <laughs> Sam Dalla, Esther Kraku, my superstar panel do stand by their back very shortly. But coming up, is Donald Trump gearing up to make, well, I reckon, possibly the greatest political comeback of all time? US talk radio king and Republican governor hopeful Larry Elder gives us his fascinating insight next. Also coming up, is it time for the Queen to permanently scale back her duties as she battles ill health? We'll discuss that and have more of tomorrow's front pages hot off the press in the media buzz.
watching GB News Live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. And we're back across the pond in the U.S. The Republicans have been busy racking up major wins. The Democrats lost Virginia in the state's election for governor in a huge upset for Sleepy Joe, whose approval rating has this month plummeted to near historic lows. And just in the last hour, we've seen yet more evidence of the president's hazy grasp on reality. This was him at a press conference in Washington just as we came on air. Mask. I poured a part of the mask outside. Yes, I do. Oh, Joe. It went on. The pain went on. You're outside, mate. It's OK. My next guest, American conservative talk radio host Larry Elder, made huge waves in the recent California recall election. While he lost out narrowly in the Democratic state, he jolted the race, prompting Biden to denigrate him as a Trump clone. As a radio fixture for millions of Californians for a generation, Larry was the, vo the voice voters felt they could count on when they were fed up with draconian COVID regulations, vaccine passports and divisive Black Lives Matter activists claiming systemic racism. And now there are suggestions this won't be Larry's last campaign. Larry Elder, great to have you on the show. So look, I've got to ask you first about this breaking press conference from Biden. I don't know if you agree with me, but I'm starting to think this bloke cannot continue in the role. His mental faculties are not strong enough. Dan, you're starting to think? <laughs> Come on. Uh, Joe Biden's job was to make sure that Donald Trump didn't get elected president. After that, he could have dropped dead within five minutes. They couldn't have cared less. His job was to make sure that Bernie Sanders, a self-described uh, socialist, did not become the nominee because they did not believe uh, that Bernie Sanders could beat Donald Trump. So Joe Biden was the supposedly moderate that they dragged across the finish line in order to make sure that he beat Donald Trump. And at some point, they were going to hand the baton over to Vice President Kamala Harris. And that was his job. So mission accomplished. But do you question whether mentally, Larry, he is capable to be president? Well, I remember during the 2008 campaign, there's a book called Game Change, uh, and they quoted uh, his running mate, Barack Obama, who said, and I'm quoting, how many more times is Joe Biden going to say something stupid, end of quote? 
Uh, Joe Biden has made the wrong decision on every major uh, foreign policy decision in his career, according to Obama's first secretary of defense, uh, Robert Gates. Uh, he's always been slow. He's always been dumb. He's always been obtuse. He's never really had any real political convictions. And now, yes, his political fac faculties seem to be diminishing. Uh, but as I said before, they couldn't have cared less. As long as they defeated Donald Trump, uh, the Democrats are perfectly happy to, to have Joe Biden hand the baton over to Kamala Harris, which will probably happen before the end of his, of his term. Now, Luke, so let's talk about that Virginia election. Huge, huge upset. Uh, do you think this marks a big game change when it comes to the Republicans being on the comeback trail? I do, Dan, and I think what happened in Virginia is that the uh, campaigners for the Democrats drew the wrong lesson about my campaign here in California. What uh, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, did was call this uh, recall election a Republican takeover. He called me more Trump than Trump. I'm not sure whether I should be flattered or insulted. Uh, and every time he invoked the name of Trump, didn't defend his record on crime, which is what I ran on, didn't defend his record on the rise of homelessness, which is what I ran on, didn't defend on, on his record on the way he shut down the state in a more severe way than did any of the other 49 governors. To the point, Dan, where a third of all small businesses are now gone forever. Kids educated in our public school system were denied a whole year of in-person education. And before the pandemic, 75 percent of black boys could not read at state levels of proficiency. I tried to get him to stick to the issues. He did not. Kept calling us a Trump deal. And that is exactly what Terry McAuliffe did in Virginia. He drew the wrong lesson. The problem is Virginia is not nearly as blue as California. Uh, and when he tried that nonsense, during the debate, because they had to have a debate. In my case, uh, the governor was able to escape without debating me. Uh, Glenn Youngkin, the Republican candidate, pointed out, you know, we've been talking now about 20, 25 minutes, and so far you've invoked Donald Trump's name five times. So uh, uh, Youngkin knew what they were going to do. He was prepared for it. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why, in my opinion, the Republican, uh, Republican won. Do you think Trump is going to run again, Larry? I do. Uh, I know a lot of people who know him, and in my opinion, the, he, he never wanted to leave the stage in the first place, as you well know. Uh, he does not feel that the election in 2020 uh, was, uh, was fair and square, uh, and he's always wanted to run again, and I believe that he will. I also, however, Dan, believe he'll have at least some challenges. I've heard that uh, his former Secretary of, of, uh, of State, Mike Pompeo, may want to run. Other people may, people may want to run as well, but there's no question in my mind that he intends to run, at least as, as of right now. Uh, if his health holds up, I see no reason why, uh, why he would not run again. If you look at the polls, the majority of Republicans want him to run again. I think it's over 75 percent, far more than, than they want anybody else to run. So he remains popular within the Republican Party. I know he remains loathed by the Democrats in much of the... Uh, of the independence, but uh, Trump uh, feels that the the uh, election was snatched away from him. And if you think about it, uh, he lost by a combined total of around 43,000 votes in about three different states. So the election was very, very, very narrow. And if you take out the shenanigans, and there were, I think Donald Trump could have won the election pretty handily. There was a major story about Hunter Biden uh, in his laptop connecting his dad to Hunter Biden's business dealings. His dad always denied that. That story came out a few days yeah. before the election yeah, the and it got shut down uh, by yeah. Twitter. It wouldn't even allow the New York Post to post their own story. So Donald Trump has good reason to be angry and good reason to feel that he lost a very, very narrow contest. Will you run again for the California governorship? I mean, do you think that you can beat Newsom if you go again? If I had more time and I had more money, I think the election would be closer. But Dan, I do not know. 75% of the registered voters in this state are registered as other than uh, Republicans. Uh, there are about a quarter of the states registered as independents. And the New York Times even said independents in California typically vote Democrat. So we're outnumbered almost three to one. It is awfully difficult. And they loathe Donald Trump. And the fact that I campaigned for Donald Trump, and you saw that picture of me with the two of us having our thumbs up, uh, probably the only public figure most hated, more hated than Donald Trump in California is Charlie Manson, and he's dead. <laughs> Very good point. Uh, look, I want to ask you about two other issues. The Black Lives Matter movement. You say it's divisive and that right. systemic racism, even in the US, does not exist. Have you been shocked to see the way the BLM movement has spread to countries like the UK? 
I have been shocked. That and critical race theory and that and reparations, all of which appear to be gaining in popularity. The whole basis for Black Lives Matter is this false notion that the cops are killing black people just because they're black. There have been many studies going back over decades showing, Dan, if anything, the cops are more reluctant, more hesitant to pull the trigger on a black suspect than a white suspect. The cops kill more unarmed whites every year than they kill unarmed, unarmed blacks. But I defy you to name an unarmed white because the media couldn't give a rip. Uh, if it's a, a white cop killing a black person, in comes all the media. Uh, if it's a, um, a white cop killing a white cop, nobody cares. Again, more uh, unarmed whites are killed every year than unarmed blacks, but Black Lives Matter would give you that impression. There is a black Harvard economist named Roland Fryer who assumed, uh, as many do, that the, the police are engaging in systemic racism, killing blacks just because they're black. He did a study and said it was the most surprising finding of his professional career. He found out again, not only were the cops not doing that, but they were more hesitant, more reluctant to pull the trigger on a black suspect than a white suspect. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason the movement is divisive is because think about it, if you're a cop and you're a white cop and you're falsely accused of engaging in systemic racism, what do you do? You pull back, you engage in what's called passive policing. Fewer stops, fewer arrests, crime goes up, and the people who are disproportionately hurt by that crime are black and brown. Look at a city like New York. New York is roughly half black and brown, but 95% of the homicide victims and the homicide perps are black and brown. So the people being hurt by passive policing because of that lie of systemic racism are the very people that Black Lives Matter claim that they care about. Good point. And then finally, uh, Larry Elder, Harry and Meghan, you know, the Duke and Duchess of Woke. <laughs> That, that's what I call them. Now, you have been opposed uh, to paid parental leave in, in your state and in the US in the past, I, I believe. How did you feel about Meghan, uh, who doesn't want to be a member of the royal family, calling up US senators, lobbying for paid parental leave, using her Duchess of Sussex title? Well, it's, it's arrogance. Uh, it's arrogance. Anytime somebody who can easily afford to pay for a family and child leave are telling taxpayers to pay for somebody else's family and medical leave. Uh, it is a complete and total assault uh, on freedom, uh, on federalism. If states want to pay for family medical leave, let them do that. The federal government should have no business whatsoever doing that. Every now and then, some congressperson will hold up the Constitution and talk about things that are uh, left to the states under what, what, under what we call the Tenth Amendment. Uh, and I would urge uh, the Duchess uh, to read the Constitution, particularly the Tenth Amendment. Uh, and then uh, maybe she ought to rethink whether or not she wants to get involved in something like this. Do you think she'd be a good politician? I mean, I speak to people all the time, Larry, who tell me Meghan believes she could be president one day, a Democratic president. Well, uh, she's welcome to try it. Um, uh, Joe Biden is extremely unpopular right now, so maybe she might be able to slide in and, and get the nomination. Uh, but, but if she wants to run, let, let her run. I mean, it's a free country. Uh, Iran never having had any experience. She doesn't have any experience in politics either. So who am I to tell her she ought not run? Yeah, well, she's very good at telling lies, so I guess maybe that will make her fit in with a lot of Democratic politicians, but there you go. Larry Alder, great to speak to you. Hope to catch up again soon, Larry Alder, live from California. As Austria segregates its unvaccinated citizens, why are we so comfortable with our once free societies being plunged into COVID dystopias? Broadcaster Carol McGiffin is uncancelled in 10 minutes. But next in the Media Buzz, my superstar panel give their take on whether it's time the Queen scaled back her official duties to protect her health. Plus, we'll have more of tomorrow's newspaper front pages hot off the press, so don't go anywhere. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there.
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Tomorrow is news tonight now in our media buzz. <laughs> and more front pages have just been delivered, so let's get to them first. The I leads with the PM's threat to over 40s to get booster jabs or risk another Christmas lockdown. It's never going to end, is it, folks? Number 10, concerned by rising cases on the continent and are urging against complacency as they refuse to rule out more restrictions. The Guardian leads with the Liverpool terrorist attack. That's the only story any newspaper should be leading on tomorrow. It reports a suspected suicide bomber blew himself up with a homemade device outside a maternity hospital, forcing the national terror threat level to be raised for the first time in months amidst fears of another potential attack. Who are you? That's the Daily Star going with the Who legend, Roger Daltrey, taking Paul McCartney's side in his feud with Mick Jagger as he brands the Rolling Stones a mediocre pub band. The Daily Telegraph reports Liverpool's suspected suicide bomber was a Christian convert. Imad al Swelmeen came to the UK from Iraq, the newspaper reports, as an asylum seeker and was confirmed at Liverpool Cathedral in 2017. Now, that cathedral, just a few minutes walk away from where the bomb went off outside the hospital. Security sources working on the investigation said the motive for the attack remains unclear. But come on, come on. We know what he was planning to do. More on the media buzz now with tonight's superstar panel, the Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, the journalist and broadcaster Sam Dowler, and the social commentator Esther Kraku. Now, another huge story over the weekend. The Queen might be forced to scale back her duties after her last-minute and very worrying withdrawal from yesterday's Remembrance Sunday service. That's according to today's Daily Mail. Now, Buckingham Palace says this is because she sprained her back. But can we really trust them after they previously misled the public about her being in hospital? Her Majesty has no major public event scheduled for the rest of this year. She's also cancelled an appearance at the Council of the Church of England tomorrow, the first time the Queen has missed her five-yearly visit to the Church's National Assembly in its 51-year history. The Queen has been on doctor's orders to rest for nearly a month after being admitted to hospital for preliminary investigations. We believe she's currently resting at Windsor Castle. So, Carol Malone, should we be more worried about the Queen's health than what the palace is letting on? No. I, I, I'm not unduly concerned. I think she's 95 years old and she's going to have a lot of little things wrong with her that are recurring. This thing that she was going to the, the Cenotaph mm. two hours before, but she's strained a muscle on her back, which doctors have said is OK. But, you know, we've got to remember, she's an elderly lady and lots of little complaints will befall her. And, and I'm, sh I'm sure she would not want those complaints made public. You know, we've got to respect that about mm. her. But I, I think what she has to do with 95 is scale back. You know, that is... She has only missed six Remembrance Day services mm. in her 69-year reign. That is... Astonishing. And, you know, I was checking today, in 2018, she did 293 engagements that year, and she was 92 then. So she I can't mean, continue Sam. at that pace. She and can't, and she's superwoman. And one of the things that I've been so angry about is that before these health setbacks, her aides had worked the woman too hard. She was, she was in Scotland, she was in Wales, she was hosting a dinner at Windsor Castle, and I know she wants to do that, Sam. I know what you're going to say, she mm. wants to do that. But it's their responsibility to say, Mum, no, but we're looking time, after but you. But at the same time, she um, obviously 
I read as well that she had travelled thousands of miles. And again, she is 95. My only issue with this is, is that if she starts to slow down, then isn't that sort of the beginning of the end? Like once, once somebody's, once it, we all know, like we have family members who have started to slow down, like and they stop, they stop being engaged. Like if she's in bed or if she's like, um, also, also, how does she sprain? Oh, how does she sprain her back? Esther, I don't, I don't yeah. think they do, do, do actually that? want her to Batman. slow down because they're going to host a load of events for her within Windsor Castle. Yeah, and I think, I think you're right about them overworking her because. With, with the last few years that we've had, the worst thing that could happen now would be to lose the Queen. Really. Oh, my God. It would just be horrific with the pandemic and all this... This country of... is not ready for Yeah, we're not ready for it. you can say she's 95 years old, Carol, but we're not emotionally just, ready I, for life without say, the Queen. I don't think anyone overworks the Queen. I think she, her she will decide. She will drive her agenda. I, yeah, I'll tell Carol, you what, we've I all had you... relatives yes. who, yes. who, who, who you need to take control of and say... You don't have 95 year old relatives that we use She's the Queen, man. You can't take control of the Queen. And I suspect she sets her own agenda. And and. I think, you know, we have to let her do that. She, I, you know, I bet she's the world's worst patient. I bet when a doctor <laughs> says to her, don't go here, I, I, think, I bet there's a lot I of argument. I think the Queen, uh, closely followed by Carol Malone, as <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the world's worst <laughs> patient, her, to be honest. But for her to miss Remembrance Day, you know, that is the most important event on her calendar yeah. in the year. Exactly, you know, which is why we're worried. Uh, but no, which is no, never, no, I think, I think it's all no, precautions. You imagine it's precautions. a doctor that would say to her, you know, imagine, imagine if a doctor said, go and do it, Mom, you're fine, and she collapsed or she fell down or she tripped, that doctor's life wouldn't be worth living, he'd be sent to the tower. But <laughs> I just think it's important that we let her set the agenda. And I think, you know, we're hearing now, she's going to do more Zoom stuff. More Zoom exactly, meetings. she can do Zoom stuff until the cows come home. Oh, I bet she'll probably be tapping what, into me, what is what this contraption? Exactly? No, she's good at she's Zoom, good she's, at she's mastered it. She knows, she's what, she's, mastered she knows it. what she's doing, uh, she's got a lot to say, and she's still... Yes. Compass mentor, she, totally. and, and she is in yes. charge no, of she her is. destiny. She is, and that's one of the really sad things. It's her uh, physical self, mm -hmm. which is yeah. at that the moment down unable at to keep up with her mental self, because, my God, she's as sharp as ever there. Uh, look, a new era of Downton Abbey is mm. nearly upon us. <sighs> and speaking of elderly legends, Dame Maggie <laughs> Smith, still going strong for now. Take a look. Oh, and that is coming in that. March. I am absolutely <laughs> going to be there. Maggie Smith, yeah, still you, going strong. Yeah, you said there, yeah. you said she's with us for now. Do you know that something I don't know, Carol. I think it must be. But, but mm. there are strong rumours that this may be the end of because, the Dowager well, Countess. Do but I don't want that to be the case. No, remember, and I don't know. Do you remember the last series? She mm. took, what's her name, the, the girl, into mm. the into room and said... I have a, I have a, an illness, a problem she wouldn't say. And she's something like 120. <laughs> when you actually add up all of her. Not, not like, Maggie Smith, but, but the, count, the Dowager Countess. I count think Maggie is. Smith might be close to 120. I like the but fact. I don't want her to go. She's the best no. character. Maggie really. Smith is an octogenarian and, yeah. you know, and just like, really. just like, I was going to say Jessica Fletcher, but um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> and well, she's Lansbury, an I mean. Yes. Um, obviously, they have, yeah. they have realised that people, especially in the American audience, they go they go to Downton well, Abbey look, for the Dowager Countess. They go for Maggie Smith. I know. So let's hope it's not the end of Maggie Smith. No. The character, I don't know. But all I'm saying is the rumour is it might be her last movie. But, you know, they may just be tricking us. Or Esther Craig, who's Sam Dalla, Carol Malone, do stand by because coming up, the crowning moment of the show as I crown today's Gracious Britain and Union Jackass with the help of my superstar panel. But next, in Uncancelled Broadcaster, Carol McGiffin gives her take on Austria's disturbingly dystopian lockdown for the unvaccinated. First, though, quick look at what's coming up in tomorrow's show. Coming up Tuesday on Dan Wooten Tonight, Strictly Come Dancing head judge Shirley Ballas joins me live to put to rest behind the scenes rumors about the hit BBC show. I'll break down the day's top stories and give you a first look at the newspaper front pages with my superstar panel. The journalist and author Rebecca Reed, conservative commentator Calvin Robinson, and the former editor of the Daily Star, Dawn Neeson. Olympic hero and record-breaking sprinter Ewan Thomas has an inside look at what's kicking off in the world of sport, including whether David Beckham is a human rights hypocrite. Political commentator Darren Grimes delivers his uncompromising take in The Outsider. Plus, I'll crown a greatest Britain in Union Jackass, and you'll get to voice your opinion on one of the day's biggest talking points in The Clash. That's Dan Wooten tonight, 9pm, Monday to Thursday, 
on GB News. But it's time now for Uncancelled. And this is where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. Now, do you know two million Austrians were plunged into lockdown yesterday simply because they had made the personal choice not to be vaccinated? Under the chilly new restrictions, which will be enforced for an initial 10 days and enforced by police spot checks, the unvaccinated are only permitted to leave their homes for essential reasons, while the fully jabbed are free to move around as normal. Austria is the first country in Europe to segregate its citizens based on their medical status, but has justified the measures as a way to contain soaring infection rates. This disturbing development comes as massive anti-lockdown protests have been held across the globe, including in Australia, the Netherlands and France. But these events, always conspicuously absent from mainstream media coverage, so why are we allowing our once free societies to drift so easily into COVID dystopia? Joining me now to discuss this, my good friend, Carol McGiffin. And Carol, isn't it crazy? All of these people, right, told us, oh, we were mad to suggest that society was going to end up segregated because all of our leaders promised us that the jab was going to be completely voluntary. Look at what's happened. Um, yeah, I, w I, I would say I told you so, but I don't like to keep repeating myself. <laughs> and um, it, it's kind of, you know, this is where it's been heading. And, and I think it's, it's, it's more than dystopian. It's kind of horrific that it's actually gone this far. And people have, up until now, I think, gone along with it and, and accepted what they've been told to do. And, and with this... The, the horrific, the most horrific thing for me is the fact that some people still think it's acceptable to uh, to segregate the unvaccinated people from the vaccinated, even though we all know that people who have been vaccinated or jabbed, as I prefer to call it, um, can still catch it. They can still spread it. So there kind of isn't that much difference between the two. Everyone, you can argue for as long as you like about viral load, but you know, you, you, some one scientist will say this, another one will say that. You know, who do you believe? It it, it, it seems to be that you have to believe what the governments uh, are choosing to believe, yeah, and, and and they're acting on on that. And also, I think I feel like I do feel like Austria is kind of the test nation, if you like. When these things happen, there's always one country that does it first, I think, to kind of test the water, to see how it works, to see how people will go along with it. Um, and, and if enough people who are jabbed still think that that's the right thing to do, let's, you know, shut these people down. Let's demonise them even further. Let's put badges on them. Let's say they're unclean and, and pretend that, all problems are down to the people who are, who haven't gone along with this thing um, and, cho and, and chosen not to have the vaccine. I find it, I, I actually can't believe, I feel like I'm in a kind of proper nightmare at the moment. Yeah, well, we saw, didn't we, Jacinda Ardern, you speak about test cases, mm. and I think because she has been the zero COVID proponent of the world, and loved by all of the hysterical scientists. I think it was so disturbing and absolutely marked the start of a new phase of this thing when she actually was asked by an interviewer, you know, oh, it looks like you're segregating society. And she said, yes, yes, we are. And she was mm. proud of it, Carol. She was proud of it. I know, they don't even pretend. That it's no. uh, that it's not a good thing, and and it, it's almost as though I mean the language coming from Jacinda Ardern and also from uh, Dan Andrews in in Melbourne mm. in Australia um, is I mean it's it's quite unbelievable really. These people are drunk on power. They're absolutely drunk on power, and it's almost as though it's almost as though there is a hymn sheet. And I hate these kind of you know these phrases that people use, but it's almost there is a hymn sheet, and it's starting in test nations and then it's seeing how they how far they can go how they can get away with it and at the end of the day it has to be i mean the coercion towards getting every single person on this earth to take that jab is is kind of i i think it's the end game and, and and also it's not really about the vaccination either i don't think it's particularly about health i never have 
And I've been kind of cancelled for saying that in the past. I've been. And that's of because you think <laughs> it's this push towards some sort of biosecurity state where government no, no, well, know everything yeah, I, about Yeah, I do you. think it's about a, con a control mechanism. Yeah, I think the vaccine passport is um, because in some places now you can't even access um, the, the places where the jabbed people can go with with a test or anything you have to oh, have yeah, yeah, this no, app, exactly well, and natural yeah. immunity carol is meaningless now no one cares about natural immunity all of a sudden which by the way is the best form of immunity <laughs> yeah and it probably always was dan but it's it and when when the uk started off by saying yeah what we're going to do is go with herd, herd immunity and then the who changed the definition of her herd immunity they changed the definition of vaccines they changed the they changed the definition of something else i can't remember what it is but it is it's almost as though it, there is a script they're all sticking to it and there and there is a place that they're going to and i and, and Carol, i you think, spend a lot of I think time, it has to be something else i'm not sure yet you spend a lot of time in france where obviously yeah. these measures have been actually much stronger and much more stringent than the uk how is the population accepting them? Because in France, I believe you cannot go to a restaurant if you are unvaccinated. Uh, no, no, you can't. But at the moment, you can still go with a test. But I okay. think that um, I, I think that might be phased out pretty soon. But the, the point is, Dan, I think there are a lot of people here in France who have taken both jabs, but still absolutely object to showing a pass to go into a bar or a restaurant or any other kind of place that should be normal activity. And there are a lot of people, I think, around the world who, who have taken both jabs and in the good faith that it would return us to normality. Now, I think... Yes, that's when me. You hear those that's people... me. And I'm so <laughs> mad. Exactly. <laughs> but you're, you're in that so camp. Mad. There are the other... The other... <laughs> The other jabbed people who prefer to say that, you know, the people who haven't had the jabs are threatening their freedom. But the problem oh. is everyone who signed up to those jabs in the first place took their own freedom away because basically everyone's locked in now. You've got the pass, you've got the jabs, you've got to have the booster. Mm -hmm. The booster program is being rolled yep. out. You know, in Austria, I mean, this is, this is where it's like get them young. Um, in Austria, they're, they're starting to approve jabs for five to 11 year olds. And those vaccines for those age groups have not even been approved by the EMA yet, the, the European Medical Aid, Medicines Agency. And I just find that that's even more horrific, but it's not about health. It's about getting everybody signed up to these jabs so that they can't do anything unless they've got that pass to be able to do it in france there's massive resistance there is massive resistance you can see it the protests that have been going on i think for 16 16 weeks almost every single saturday massive protest in paris and cities and small towns and villages all over france in italy as well all over europe and as you say they just don't get reported and they don't get reported because they yeah they yeah, don't they want people to know that there are so many of us, there are so many people around the world that object to this and they want everyone to think, well, everyone else has gone along with it, so we might as well go along with it. Get yep. the pass, have the jabs, do whatever we have to do. And, well, indeed. and there are, and, there are and more people against it than, than are for it, I think. I, I completely agree. And it was on my first show, Carol, where I where I said, you know, I, I fear that we are turning into a biosecurity state and there was huge pushback against me. But that's where we are heading. And if we're not careful, we're going to end up like Austria. Carol McGiffin, you keep us posted. We'll speak again very soon. Thank you so much for joining Uncancelled tonight. But time now to reveal today's greatest Britain and Union jackass. My superstar panel back with me, the Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, journalist and broadcaster Sam Dowler and the social commentator Esther Kraku. Carol, your greatest Britain. Do you know, we're chomping at the bit here to come in on that discussion. <laughs> you two sound like so mad nonsense. conspiracy theorist. God, what, so much what? nonsense. So much nonsense. Anyway. Nonsense. Refreshing. Yes. Yeah, so well, Carol, you can't deny that we're now 
heading in that direction. No, we're not. I can, what I can deny is that people who have had the booster shot have 93.1% 93 immunity to COVID, which I think oh, is a great thing. The but anyway, with a 99% recovery. Let's move bring on. It on. And, and Carol's talking about kids getting viruses in France. I'm sorry, but kids get v vaccines here. Sorry, they get measles, they get mumps, they get yeah, the rubella is, vaccines. If you look at the child survival rate for COVID, which I did today in the UK, if even teenagers, no deaths, Carol, no deaths. But look, we've anyway, got to get to Greatest Britain okay. very quickly. Who's so I make no Britain? apologies. It's the Queen. No, she didn't make this year's Remembrance Day service, but she has for the 63 others yes. she's attended Great in her 69 years. Can I just say as well, when crowds realised she wasn't coming, they started to sing God Save the Queen even louder than they ever have oh. before. They, that was singing for her to be there. Sam Daly, your Greatest Britain. My Greatest Britain uh, is Ollie Alexander from Years and Years, who um, was at the MTV European Music Awards last night and spoke very succinctly about LGBTQ lives in Hungary uh, because of the new anti-gay laws that they have just passed earlier in the year. Well yes. done, Ollie, for speaking why, why, why up. Why was he dressed Esther like a Kraku, taco? your greatest Britain. Did you notice he's dressed like a taco? <laughs> <laughs> yum, yum, I say. <laughs> My greatest Britain is John Cleese for cancelling himself. Um, <laughs> can cancel culture, uh, which I think is brilliant. More people should be doing that, really. Cancel OK, well, I'm going with Carol, the greatest Britain. Obviously, yeah. come on, we all deep down agree, don't we? It's, it's always the Queen. queen. It's, it's the Queen. Of course, it's the Queen. The queen. Uh, and we want her back fighting fit, so look after yourself, Mum. Uh, Carol, your union jackass. My jackass is an idiot mother called Terry and Shaquille. She's the only woman ever to have been in prison in this country for joining ISIS. She ran away with her one-year-old son to Syria, and she said she's doing a new documentary thing, and she said today, I should have taken him on holiday and not joined ISIS. Yes, understatement of the century, love. You should have went on holiday. Sam Dowler, your union jackass. Mine nomination. is um, Elon Musk for tweeting to Bernie Sanders saying, uh, oh, I thought you were dead already. I mean, <laughs> come on, Elon Musk. I keep Bernie, forgetting you're alive with the exact Bernie, words, but yes, Bernie, I, I Bernie agree. Bernie, Sanders, Bernie Sanders has given his whole life to service to his country, and Elon Musk <laughs> is more interested in flying to the moon and uh, lining his I own know, but thank pockets. God we don't have Sanders as president. That's that would be even more, more of a nightmare than Biden. Uh, Esther Kraku, your union um, jackass. Alok Sharma for crying. <laughs> Oh, you, you, you tough saying, woman, Esther. I just, I You're not just, like a man in touch with their emotional it's side. Not, it's and it's, not, it's, not, it's something to cry about It's as not well. about that. How ridiculous that these these politicians have all flaunted the, the rules that they want us to stick by by polluting to the high heavens just to get to this conference where they're all going to tell us what to do. And knowing perfectly well that the largest polluters are not there. And then what the largest polluters who are not there remotely just said, actually, we're not going to stick to it, which was very much a real possibility. And then he cries about it. Well, great nominations. I I have to be honest, though, Carol Malone has done the double tonight because the union jackass hey. is most certainly hey. Tarina Shaquille. What a ridiculous interview oh, no. this was. Um. Yeah, you shouldn't have joined ISIS. Of course you should go on holiday. <laughs> That's obvious. And I'm glad she served prison time, Carol. I really am. She said she was she was a woman in turmoil and trouble. She said, I was just someone who lost my way. Oh, Tosh. Please. Well, that's a vulnerable please. person. Though, Carol right? Malone, Sam Dowler, Esther Kraku, fabulous superstar panel. I'm back again tomorrow night from 9 o'clock. Uh, but right now, it's time for headliners. Ooh. Can't wait for that. See you again tomorrow night. Good night. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. Things turning quite windy overnight across northern Britain, and that'll stay that way through Tuesday as well. There'll be a bit of rain for Scotland and Northern Ireland. But most of England and Wales will be dry thanks to this area of high pressure. It's further north, though, where this low and this set of weather fronts is approaching. Ahead of all of that, we've got a, a dying weather front that's still been making for uh, quite a dank and drizzly day over parts of northern England and Wales. And still some rain and drizzle here through the evening, but it continues to fizzle out. Uh, further south, we could see some fog patches where we have some clearer skies, and that could take a while to clear on Tuesday. Meanwhile, that weather system really pepping the winds up across the far northwest. Quite mild here, but elsewhere, uh, a bit of a chilly start to Tuesday. Mostly grey starts, some places seeing a bit of sunshine. A bit of fog in the south will take a, a while to clear away. Could stick around, certainly through the morning rush out. 
it's going to turn wet across western Scotland and for a time through Northern Ireland. Spell of rain here through the middle of the day. That'll be followed by some lively showers too across the far northwest. But for most of England and Wales, it'll stay dry. Yes, lots of cloud, but where we see some brightness, it's going to be pretty mild. 12, 13 degrees. Through Tuesday evening, that rain will trickle into parts of northern England and Wales for a time, but again, it kind of fizzles out. Lots of showers will come into Northern Ireland and Western Scotland. Some snow on the tops of the mountains across Scotland. Staying windy here as well. That will uh, again be a feature of the weather on Wednesday. Quite a blustery day with showers for Northern and Western Scotland. The odd one for Northern Ireland, Northwest England. But again, many southern and eastern areas dry on Wednesday. Probably a bit brighter as well, particularly in the south. Better chance of seeing some sunshine but a little bit cooler with temperatures about closer to average, but still double digits for most. There will be a fairly brisk breeze blowing though on Wednesday. It turns milder again through the rest of the week with a lot of cloud, some rain at times in the northwest, but a lot of dry weather as well. Goodbye. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GB Views at GBNews.UK.